Hi, welcome to AppNexus. My name is Riley, uh, like Paul said, and all of what he said was true. Um, I did go to school for drama, and I gave that up because I couldn't find a job. <clears throat> so I decided to act my way into a computer science job. It sort of worked out so far. All right, so um, we're going to talk about real-time big data, specifically Lambda architecture for processing of data in real-time and sort of how we do it at AppNexus. So this is me. If you need to Twitter me, if you need to Twitter AppNexus Engineering, those are the handles, uh, yada, yada. So Lambda architecture. Lambda, the Lambda architecture is a phrase that was coined by um, Nathan Martz. If you can go to nathanmartz.com if you want to read about more about him. Um, and the Lambda architecture uh, sort of consists of five main pieces, and I'm going to cover these throughout the talk as we go here. I'll go through these quickly. All right, you need data. So the data generally comes in and goes to a batch layer, which I will cover, and a streaming layer, which I will cover. And the batch layer sort of exists for two reasons, right? It's to maintain the master data set or the source of truth about the stuff that you're processing and do some aggregations, some pre-computes to make the load of data less log level and more aggregated or rolled up. For the serving layer, which is what pushes this out via reporting or other things to people around the world to consume, maybe in your own company, right? A Lambda architecture also consists of a speed layer, right, which is meant to compensate for the latency introduced by batch. And there can be a significant amount of latency introduced by batch if you're dealing with a huge amount of data. And I will cover that because we deal with a huge amount of data. And the last piece that you need for a fully complete Lambda architecture is a query stitching layer. So generally, you, have, you need a way to query the stuff that's being decided in real time and the stuff that's being decided in batch, stitch them together, and present the whole view of what's happening. Now, at AppNexus, these are the components that make up our Lambda architecture, right? We use Hadoop, HDFS, Hive, various other things in a batch layer, right? We use Kafka and some other internal stuff for a streaming layer. Um, in Hadoop, that's exactly what you expect, a bunch of MapReduce jobs, and some pushing out to Vertica, where we maintain our serving layer. And then we use two components. Um, some of you may be familiar with SAMSA. None of you are familiar with RATSODA, and I will cover that, because it's an internal thing. Uh, and we don't do five yet. So we have no real good mechanism at this point of query stitching uh, for this speed layer and this batch layer yet. I haven't figured that out yet. So I'm leaving that off of the discussion going forward. So. One of the big uh, tenets, I guess, of this Lambda architecture is that batch, uh, sorry, streaming layers have to be inaccurate. And the reason for this is they have to be inaccurate because generally we try to use RAM to do things quickly. And when we're doing RAM to, use, to do things quickly, we don't want to spend giant piles of money uh, to buy all the RAM we need to fit our en entire massive data set in RAM so that we can do these speed layer calculations quickly and make them surfable, right? So to get around this, the massive amount of memory that's required to do something like that, and not to mention the massive amount of compute power, right? Most, most um, of these implementations will use uh, approximation algorithms, your hyperlog logs, your bloom filters, your things to count what is a close approximation of what is going to eventually be materialized in your batch layer. You just sort of want to get a feel for what's happening in real time. Right? And I'm going to posit that if you intelligently use on-demand on paging and write some really fast apps, you don't have to have an inaccurate speed layer. In fact, you don't even need a batch layer if you do it right. And I'll talk about how we do that. <laughs> By talking about uh, our AppNexus real-time streaming transactions on our platform. So uh, Paul covered this a little bit. I'm going to go over it a little bit more. Um, we are an advertising technology stack as a service. So we were founded in 2007 as a cloud hosting company for advertising, right? And that morphed into advertising exchange services, which is just like a stock exchange for buyers and sellers of ad space instead of equities. And we see about 30% of internet display traffic right now, um, which is quite a bit, as you can imagine. 
So this is kind of hard to see. I'm sorry it didn't translate too well. We get a lot of requests. These are in millions. Uh, our peak all-time number of requests coming into our web-facing infrastructure was 5 million a second. And we hit that actually a year ago um, in January, or early January a year ago, we, we hit 5 million individual queries per second coming into our web-facing infrastructure. Here's some more stats so you can get an idea of how much crap we're dealing with. A lot of queries, a lot of uh, auctions per second, 120 billion auctions a day is what we roll through uh, from a data processing perspective. And this is sort of what it looks like, very simplified, right? We have uh, the little face there is a, like a user, like an internet person. And the little face has a tag on a page somewhere and they make a request to a component we call the impression bus, shortened as imp bus here, right? That's what gets the 5 million requests a second. Uh, and then we also have integrations to upstream SSPs or other advertising exchanges, if you will, um, that act like us higher up, right? They do basically the same thing. They have some other user who has a tag on page. They've conducted an auction. They sent part of the auction to us to evaluate what we might do, and we might waterfall to other people, et cetera, and it goes on forever. This, I'm going to spend most of the time, and I wish this would go down further. They're working on it. Um, I'm going to spend most of my time this evening talking about the right side of this, this, this picture, right? The Packrat, Kafka, Samza, Ratsoda, the batch streaming, and Vertica, and how we do all that. So one of the interesting things about this platform is not only does it have to, salt to serve 5 million queries per second, we have to do them all in less than 120 milliseconds. And this is sort of an internal um, requirement we place on ourselves because uh, anything longer than that results in a really bad experience for the end user. Uh, Nobody wants to sit and have their page not fully render for seconds at a time because the ad serving stack that you're using is incredibly slow, right? So we have this speed limit. If we're not done in 120 milliseconds, we will blank our PSA because we don't want to ruin the page experience. Now, another point to, to, to remember here is this, is this is really hard to do at this scale. This is a graph of bidders who are hooked into our platform who get every uh, ad request that comes in to us, and they make their own valuation about what that sort of ad slot is worth, right? And then they send it back to us. And they have 120 milliseconds to do this for every one. The line at the top there, this purple one, uh, is a 95% timeout rate. That means that particular bidder, and I've anonymized this, so we're not gonna name names here, but every one of these bidders on our platform is failing to respond 95% of the time. And even if they respond in 121, 121 milliseconds, we will ignore it anyway. So they're basically wasting a whole bunch of time. I'm not sure what they're doing. But you, as you can see for the rest of the ecosystem, right, a lot of people time out. And these are measured in days. And uh, several people are bad. Most of the people tend to time out in the 20% range when we get to our peak traffic, right? It's really hard to deal with all those requests without spending a lot of money, right? This is our bidder timeout rate, and this is great that it's cut off. <laughs> Down here, you can see right here, there's a little tiny blip right there, and there's an, a couple of other ones. We probably had something crash, but we tend to time out around 0.1%, around 0.1% of the time, right? So the vast majority of the traffic we see, we are actually evaluating and returning bids appropriately a lot. So it's really hard to do this. And you should come see Paul talk about it. It's really interesting. So in order to talk about this, uh, how, how much data is generated and how we process it, I need to sort of talk you through how an advertising exchange works quickly, right? A very simple case first. We have a user with a tag on page. In one, they send an ad request to our impression bus. That's one. Two, the impression bus makes a, what we call a bid request that uh, gathers up all the information about the user and the, the site that they're on and you know, any segments or cookie information we might have about them. It gathers all this stuff up, it packages it up, and it sends it to a set of bidders. One of them is our own internal bidder, which has the very low timeout rate. It also sends it to everybody else hooked into our platform and says, bid on this. This Riley is worth X. Whoa. 
So the bidder will respond. The bidder will respond uh, in, in three with a bid response that says, hey, this user Riley is worth you know, a penny to me and I want to show him this dancing cat as my ad. That comes back in three. Then the impression bus in four will log out uh, the fact of the impression, the fact that the auction happened in four. We call that an impression. Uh, and this is where the streaming starts. So I tried to color code all these things so they're always the same color. Sort of brown orange is streaming, right? Uh, in five, the impression bus will tell the winning bidder, you won, hey, you won, you had the best one cent ad for the cat thing, right? And then the bidder will turn around and log out a different piece of information, which is all of the buy side information. So you can think of this like sell side information, logged out to some kind of streaming thing, buy side information, logged out to some kind of streaming thing. What we have to do to complete the transaction is join those two logs together, right? This is a very simple case. And it gets a little more complicated. When we are a party to a third party exchange or some other upstream SSP, one, two, three, and four are the same. We get an ad call, bid request, bid response, log out the fact of the auction. Then we have to wait because we don't know if we won. We just tell the upstream SSP, hey, here's our bid. It was you know, the best bid we could find on our platform and it's two cents for the cat ad. And we send it back to the SSP. The SSP has all these things coming in from all kinds of downstream exchanges or bidders or whatever. It puts those all together, it picks a winner. Now if it picks us in five, it'll say, hey, you won, yay, right? And then the impression bus will turn around and tell the bidder, hey, you won from that auction that happened some time ago in the past. And then the bidder will log out the buy side information. But there's an extra piece of information now, and that is the accept or the win notification that came from the upstream SSP. So when we log out four, we don't know if we won or not. We're just logging it out for, for keeping track of it. We know we won an eight and we log out a different piece of information. So now our join has become a little bit more complicated. We've got to join three pieces of information, the, law of the impression, the win notification, and the buy side information. Now we have three things, but it gets, as you can imagine, more complicated. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight are the same. All that stuff happens with an SSP, but now the SSP sends the ad back to the page. And on that ad, there is a bit of JavaScript, let's say, that detects whether or not the ad is actual, actually viewable, right? And that JavaScript runs, and the ad is currently off the page somewhere, and eventually the user scrolls down, and the ad becomes visible, and that JavaScript makes a decision. The ad was viewed, it's viewable now. It's not either hidden 40, 40 Z frames down, and it's not off the page somewhere, out of view, right? It's actually visible. So they will uh, make, that's nine, and then 10 will send a view record callback to the impression bus that says, hey, this ad was actually viewed, right? And then if the transaction happens to be cost per viewable impression, right, which is something we offer on our platform, then the impression bus has to turn around and tell the buy side, the bidder, hey, this was viewed. And then the bidder has to go, okay, cool. I'm gonna log out in 13 the fact that I have this viewable cost and he'll log that out. Right? And the impression bus will also log out, hey, this was viewed to the stream. Right? And then it gets even more complicated. We have third party verification in our system. So places like Double Verify or, or the like will determine if the ad we've shown is fraudulent or not or happens to hit a fraudulent site. That pixel is dropped with the ad. The third party verifier verifies whether or not it's kosher and then they will call back with some information called spend protection. You're not gonna pay for an ad if it's fraudulent. Right? So there's a feature we offer. The third party verifier will call back in 14, 15 will log out another thing. So now we've got one, two, three, four, five, six pieces of information to join to complete the transaction. As you can imagine, it gets expensive. So all of this stuff is flying around through a system we call PackRat internally. PackRat is a homegrown data router. It's actually a really simple component, right? It's a buffer compressed forward to multiple data centers throughout the world. And we do this um, through what started as ASCII. Like when, when this company was very young, we used to send data around the world as tab separated ASCII, which was horrible for a lot of reasons that I don't want to get into. Um, but we do at least once delivery. So we try to drop something off and if it fails, uh, we log it to disk and then we try to send it again forever until it succeeds, which means we can end up with duplicates, but we're okay with that because we don't want to lose any data. 
Uh, it also does high volume disk throughput uh, to actually get this stuff into HDFS, and I'll cover how that works in a, in a minute. And the last thing that Packrat does that's important is it's a Kafka producer, which is another component of the streaming architecture. So this is guaranteed delivery in Packrat. If I have a Packrat in Amsterdam, which is one of our data centers, it tries to send some data to New York. Let's say the data, we have a network partition, and it doesn't get there. Right? So AMS turns around right to disk. Now it's on disk and safe in Amsterdam. We have another program that runs on the box called Repack-D, which will read off this failure location and try forever and ever and ever until it succeeds. And as a result, as people of you who, those of you who do distributed systems will recognize immediately, well, what if the post gets through but the act never got back? Well, that's the duplicate. But if the post never got through, it gets through the first time, right? So this is the amount of data Packrat actually does in, in uh, rows per minute. We peak out around 1.5 billion with a B rows on our platform a minute going through this system. It's, we compress this down to about 3 million requests, uh, actual HTTP requests to, for sending this data around per minute. Uh, and it's about 60 gigabytes per minute of data. This is compressed. When we uncompress it, as you can imagine, it's, it's, it's quite a bit larger. This is the compressed data that we're sending over the wire continuously. As I'm speaking right now, we're sending all this data around. We run it in five DCs. Uh, Los Angeles, New York, the ones with the black arrows here are what we call master data centers. This is where the HDFS installations are, or Hadoop installations are, where we actually process data. Uh, Amsterdam, Frankfurt, and Singapore are what we call, uh, this is a horrible word, we, we, they're called slave data centers. Uh, whatever. Anyway, that, those uh, data centers do not do disk storage unless they absolutely have to because of failure reasons. Instead, they just keep things in RAM and forward them on, keep things in RAM and forward them on. That's Packrat. Now, in New York, in LAX, we have this um, paired program right, called Courier, and its sole job is to take the data that Packrat writes to disk, validate it, and then shove it into Hadoop HDFS as quickly as it can for processing. <clears throat> So Packrat does a couple things that are nifty that you might care about if you have to shuffle a lot of data around. It groups by like type, so you will never write a buffer where we intermingle an impression and a win notification or an impression and a bid row into the same buffer. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Uh, we prefer a minimum size when we send. It's 128K per buffer. That's what we prefer to send. If we don't get there because the particular log we're sending doesn't have high enough volume to get to that size, we fall back to a 10-second wait, which is configurable. So we can actually take an individual log in our system and say, you know what, I know this log is low volume, and I know that uh, it's not going to ever fill up the 128K buffer to flush, but we really, we really care about the latency for this log. So we turn it down, do whatever we want, and Packrat will flush it very quickly. We snappy compress everything on the wire. It's the best combination of compression and CPU utilization to keep this cheap. It's HTTP host, like I said. And we use RD Kafka for Kafka production. If any of you are dealing with Kafka in C, uh, I recommend you check it out. It's pretty good. Uh, I talked about this. If you're doing ASCII tab separated or ASCII anything, stop what you're doing immediately and pick a schematic format and start using that. There's, there's gains to be made all over the place from just dumping ASCII. Not to mention uh, the gains that can be made inside HDFS because you're paying actually a quite a significant cost to reread all that ASCII parse it back into the data types you need to actually do some useful calculation and, and then maybe write it back out to ASCII, you, you're paying that cost multiple times, so stop doing that. Most of what we send now is AN message, and I will cover AN message in a little bit of detail in a bit. So we're done with step one of our Lambda architecture. We have data, a lot of it. We send it to batch via disk and courier into HDFS, and we send it to streaming via Packrat directly to Kafka. All right, now we have step one covered. Now we have to process the data. There's a couple of shared concepts uh, in data processing that I'm going to cover quickly first. Joins, and I covered this a little bit when I talked about how an advertising exchange works, but joins can be time delayed. Uh, you can think of this as the, the pixel that comes in 14. We have no control over this third-party verifier. They may take 20 minutes to send 
the pixel through to us. We have no control over really of the user's browser, right? They may start, start to render a page and shut their laptop, right? Or they're on mobile and they go through a tunnel on a train and they're cut off. And then they come out the other side and the pixel comes through and it's 20 minutes later. We have no control over that. So these joins that we eventually have to complete can be time delayed. That's not to mention SSPs, which are generally pretty fast, but there are some SSPs, if any of you have ever dealt with Facebook, for example, they actually document a 12 hour win notification window. They could actually not send you a win notification for 12 hours. And if you think about it, it makes sense. If you've ever used Facebook, um, they have a news feed. I'm, I'm told it's very popular. And in that news feed, they intersperse ads. And they actually don't send win notifications on those ads that they auction until the ad becomes visible, which means they render, they, they may auction 20 ads, and there's one way down on the bottom of your news feed. And you scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll, and eventually you get to that spot. And that's when the wind notification fires. We have this big disjoint problem in time. We have this auction that happened in 120 milliseconds, and then three hours later, we get this wind notification. We've got to put those things together, which is kind of difficult. Now, it seems to fit nicely with MapReduce, right? You just get these things. We know when the auction happened. We can sort of put everything into a time bucket and then process the whole bucket and be done. The problem is, how do you deal with late data? And this, is, this actually is a tricky problem. If I have an hour that's closed, I'm done processing stuff, and let's say one of those Facebook things happened three hours later, and I drop it into that bucket, because I happen to know when the auction was, so I drop it into that bucket for processing. How do you, what do you do? You have to go back that three hours ago and reprocess that hour, or do you not? You basically have two choices. Go back and reprocess, because it changed all your numbers, or don't. And we actually have some thresholds in the batch system that decide, should we re really go back and reprocess this or should we not? Because it's not that much data or it is that much data, we have to. So this is a tricky problem. And most exchanges do not do loss notifications. This means we're told if we win, we're never told if we lose. And that's important because it makes every join sparse. Right? If I had a guaranteed, if I had a thing and a win or a loss, it's easy for me to join. It's either a win or a loss and I know the answer. If the loss comes, I'm done, I don't have to wait anymore. But because we only get wins, we only know if we lose if we wait some period of time and decide we give up, we're not gonna get a win, we must have lost. And the reason for this is on exchanges, the vast majority of data is losses, right? And we, might be, we may try to see 120 billion ads a day, we may only transact on 10 billion, which means that 110 billion rest of those ads right, would be loss notifications. It would inflate the amount of data we have to process by so much, and most people have decided, you know what, let's just time out. It's better for us. So this is a picture of the sparse problem. At the top we have the green line is uh, impressions, the blue line is the buy side information, and the red line there is win notifications. And somewhere in this C is the actual number of transactions. It's probably somewhere like here. But we don't know until we process all the data. So the other shared concept to remember is what I mentioned earlier is this thing we use internally called AN message, which is schematic information about logs, really, right? So we write these JSON documents that describe what a log looks like, including data types and uh, range validations and all this other interesting stuff. And then we run it through Python code generation and we generate the ability to parse or serialize this particular log format in any kind of on the wire format or on disk format we care to generate code for, right? This is basically Jinja templating to generate code and that we then compile and then use, right? And we do this for multiple languages. So well, this is most of our stack on the real time platform is in C. So we have all these different C files that get generated that compile down to very fast uh, serialization, deserialization code in multiple formats. We also do this for Java and Python. And this is very important because it gives everybody flexibility. This means that the real-time platform can send something like native, which I'll cover in a minute, because it's very, very cheap to send, both on the serialization and deserialization side. And we don't want to spend too many cycles on our real-time systems actually dealing with logging. We want to keep that as cheap as we can. So we'll use native there, but the data team who actually does the batch process I'm gonna talk about wants to deal with protobuf because it's safer, 
and there's a lot of tooling around it, and it's easier for them to deal with protobuf. So we can actually have a component in the middle, like Packrat, take in one thing, translate it, and spit out something else, and the code is transparent to the developer of the Packrat application, which is really neat. Um, this is how fast it is. Uh, I just ran a quick test to, to test this. JSON's on the top, protobuf is in the middle, and native is on the bottom. As you can see, native is 10x faster than JSON, and about 3x faster than protobuf. Native is just a basically an x86 structure on the wire with some allowances for strings and arrays and things like that. It's a, sort of dangerous, but also really fast. But uh, going back to this, we're probably going to end up um, deprecating this and using something like Captain Proto or flat buffers or something that provides the same level of speed with a little bit more safety. Okay. All right. Batch. So data comes, as we covered earlier, from the impression bus and the bitter through Packrat streaming directly to disk where it's put into HDFS and now we're going to process it. This is what it looks like. AN message buffers to Packrat, right, writes to disk, Courier picks it up and writes into HDFS as either protobuf or parquet files. And for those of you who don't know what parquet files is, I'll cover that in a minute. We then run MapReduce and then we spit it out to Vertica, really simple, straightforward. It runs uh, 10 minutes after the hour. Now, the reason we do this is the late data problem. We have upstream buffering, right? We have network partitions. We have all kinds of things going wrong when you have five disconnected data centers throughout the world. All kinds of stuff can happen and break. And as a result, uh, even under normal operation, we, we can't start processing something like as soon as the hour closes and have like you know a million rows come in after that because something was stuck somewhere or some buffering took a little bit longer. So we wait 10 minutes. That's how we solve the late data problem. Uh, we then run multiple serial stages in HDFS. So we do stage one where we do this first part of the join with the impression and the win notification to create some artifact, right? And then we take that and we join it to buy side information to create some other artifact. And we join that to some more view information to create some other artifact. And all these things are like a waterfall, right? They take about 30 minutes on our system to run which is a long time. It's uh, 7,300 maps, basically, for this process, 2,600 reducers. We, if you run uh, non-hyperthreaded machines, it would cost us about 400 machines to run this based on the biggest size of the map job. So 4,800 maps is our biggest mapper at 12 divided by, by 400 machines, right? But we're smart, and we do run hyperthreading, so it's only 200 actual physical machines to do that. It's a lot. Okay. We have batch and streaming. We have a batch layer. I quickly covered, because that's not the point of this. Uh, and we have a serving layer, right? It goes into Vertica and people can read it. And we, we got all that covered. Now I'm going to talk about the speed layer. Speed layer processing. Okay. Speed layer goes like this. And message to Packrat to Kafka, to Rat Soda, which I will cover, back to Kafka, to Samza, process and back to Kafka and then more processes after that that go in and out of Kafka multiple times. For those of you who don't know what Kafka is, and I'd be surprised if anybody here doesn't know what Kafka is by this point, it is a durable pub sub message queue with replicate replication for high availability. It's sort of a transaction log reimagined as a, a, a message queue. Um, the consumer maintains the offset uh, for this gets around the slow subscriber problem, right, where the, the broker itself doesn't have to keep track of where everybody is. It just keeps data, and people ask for it, and it gives it out. And they keep track of where they are, and everything is good. Uh, and the, the topic partition is sort of the level of atomicity in Kafka. So everything inside a topic and partition is guaranteed to be ordered. Anything outside, like within a topic, is not guaranteed to be ordered with respect to other partitions. So we push quite a bit of data. This is about 1.2 million rows per second going through some Kafka thing. We actually push even more than that. This is almost two and two and a half million per second. Um, we run it on this hardware in case any of you are, are thinking about using Kafka. We use, um, so we have some smaller clusters that do not this, they do other things, but we, the main clusters we use in New York and LA have 32 nodes. They're 12 core E5s. We use a 12 disk, one terabyte, 10K SAS RAID 6, and not RAID 10. I know some of you are saying, idiot, 
why don't you run RAID 10? It's faster. It turns out, is Gong here? It turns out we were building these machines to do this, and Gong was like, Gong is one of our uh, people who works in tech ops here. He said, I'm going to test RAID 6. I was like, why? Well, don't waste your time. Just set it up as RAID 10 and let's go, because I need it to be fast. And he tested it, and it turns out RAID 6 is faster. And I know you don't believe me, but I, I, I encourage you to test it. The reason it's faster in this case, I think, is because of the number of spindles. On a RAID 10, you're cutting down to effectively four, three actual addressable disks because they're replicated so many times. But with a RAID 6, you're spreading that over many more disks plus parity. So it's, it's actually ends up being slightly faster. The RAID 10 actually did better with very, very large writes, um, interestingly. And we run 128 gigs of RAM on our Kafka machines. So Kafka is a buyer beware sort of situation. It is still pre-released software. It is still not perfect. We have hit many of these particular issues, some of which are nasty, some of which are not that bad. Uh, the nasty side being just losing data, not good. Um, the not so nasty is, you know, compression drivers don't, you know, compression drivers for the client don't work with the server or whatever. Those, you know, turn off compression. Uh, the, the solutions for these are not great. Um, basically, it's, for most of these, it's just restart the cluster. When you have 32 nodes and you can't have too many down, restarting the cluster might take a few hours. Uh, you can also patch Kafka and run a non-release version, but that doesn't sound like fun to me. Um, or you can upgrade to Kafka 0 0.9, which I'm told is a lot more stable with respect to all of these, and most of these are fixed, some of them are not. Um, so buyer beware, if you're, if you're looking for a high volume data streaming thing, beware that it's not all roses. You have to sort of know what you're buying. So this is an example, uh, I want to talk about this quickly, of how Kafka actually loses data. So uh, on the bottom line here is time going forward, and that's Zookeeper. Okay, so at time zero, we have a producer who's the green guy, P, and he writes to the leader for a topic and partition, right? And some data gets written. And that's all kosher because the leader then replicates it to two forwarders and we're good. Our connection with Zookeeper is stable. Everybody's happy. So data at time zero is now safe. Time one. At time one, we have a network partition or other problem or heavy load, it doesn't matter. The leader loses uh, connectivity with the followers and they be, fall out of being in sync replicas, right? But the leader continues to accept data. This is important to note. It can't replicate it anymore, but it's still taking it. Its connection with Zookeeper has not yet timed out. But in time two, it does actually lose a Zookeeper connection. It loses quorum. It falls out of being an addressable leader for this topic. It doesn't know what's going on anymore. So then it starts rejecting information. This is good. This is what you want. I can't actually post things into Kafka anymore because it has gotten into a bad state, right? In time three, a new leader is elected, right? So we've moved this topic partition to this broker. The old broker becomes a follower and the other follower remains the same. Zookeeper's happy and uh, the producer writes to the new leader, and that's great. But those of you who understand distributed systems might ask, what happened to this data? This data disappears, and that sucks. So what happens is you write it, you get an acknowledgment and everything, like, hey, that's cool, I got it. And then some time passes, and then because he becomes a follower, Kafka is actually set up to just do what the leader says. And so it drops the data that had been written back here and overwrites it with the, the data from the new leader, which is leaving out this, because it never got it. And this is how you can lose data. And this is, there are some workarounds for this. Increase your uh, it, it required in-sync replica size to, to something very large. The problem with doing that is it defeats the purpose of having a high throughput system. If I make if I have a 32 node cluster and I need 16 in sync replicas, I might as well have a 16 node cluster because they're going to be writing way, way too much data on each node. Okay, Rat Soda. This is where it starts to get fun. So, Rat Soda is a homegrown complex event processor written in C. I looked at um, Esper, which some of you may know is a complex event processor written in Java which uses like a SQL-like language on top of streams, which you do stuff. 
Um, Esper doesn't really shard, and it can't handle our data volume load and keep everything in RAM on a single box. No good. Um, we look at a couple of other things like Spark, really slow. Um, Samza, we tried it. I'll talk about that in a bit. So it does extremely high volume, complex event processory things like aggregation, deduplication, joins, maxes, things that you would want to know about your data as it's flowing by. It's also a Kafka producer and consumer. And this is important. So it operates on windows of time, just like you can imagine a Spark streaming. It's like mini batch. We use Lua to actually control the underlying functionality of Ratsoda. And we use Lua JIT to make it fast. Scripts are single threaded by design, and we actually saturate a machine by just running multiple scripts, one per core usually. Um, it's capable of processing millions of rows per second uh, per node, which is important when you're dealing with the fire hose that we have. So, oh, okay. Uh, unlike the contemporary wisdom of, of complex event processing or stream processing in general, we don't use RAM, or we use RAM, but we don't use it on purpose to do this really difficult join. We actually use the disk, right? But if you use it intelligently, you can actually get quite good, good performance out of it. So we use an append-only compressed log and an embedded KV store called LMDB to actually perform these joins in real time, right? And we use very large time windows. We can actually take advantage of the fact that most of the stuff that happens on our platform is very um, close together in time. Like an impression happens in 120 milliseconds. Most of the time, all the stuff related to that is going to sort of fall in that couple of second range, right? And as a result, uh, we get a lot of performance even using the disk because of the file system, OS cache, and the RAID cache, and I'll cover that in a second. Um, so recovery is instantaneous because everything that is read off Kafka is written to disk locally on Ratsoda, so we have it. And if we need to shut down or stop and do some work, and then turn it back on later. It'll pick up from where we were last and keep going. Great. Uh, we manage the Kafka offsets on the node itself. Uh, a single Ratsoda node can peak out at about 700,000 sparse joins per second, where we've got four or five pieces in the join. Uh, it's about a gigabyte per second sparse join speed, which is really fast. Uh, so it takes advantage of several layers of cache. One is the OS level cache, right? We write stuff into a file. Right? It's now in the OS page cache. And then eventually, even if it falls out, it will be written into the RAID controller, which has its own 8 meg, 12, 16 meg controller uh, cache. So it's sitting there. It hasn't actually hit the spindles yet. It'll be written behind eventually. Right? And because, like I said, 97% of the joins that come through our system are complete, completely joined in, within 30 seconds, because they're all close together in time, almost everything we do hits cache. It very, very, very rarely hits the actual disk. Once in a while, we get those outliers where we get that three-hour join thing that comes in from Facebook. We've got to actually go back on the disk and fetch some data to complete the join. But it happens so rarely that it doesn't really impact performance. Uh, and LMDB, which we use internally for a couple things, um, relies on MemMap, which relies on page cache, and everything is fast because everything is kept uh, close in time. So. Originally, when we, we wrote Ratsoda, we wanted to get it on its feet quickly, so we wrote a domain-specific language for it, which is pretty ugly, um, if anyone can understand this. It's reverse Polish notation, and it's stack-based. Really cool. So this will say, uh, take this field, seller member ID, out of the impression and stick it in this thing called D. Right? If the variable uh, push D push the value of D onto the stack, push zero onto the stack, run an equal operation, and the equal operation would pull the last two things off the stack and compare them and push the answer on the stack, right? Jump EQ will pull the last thing off the stack, evaluate it, and then jump here if it's equal zero, right? Which will go down here, which will do something else. And that's how it runs straightforward. Now it's very fast, but horrible to deal with. So we abandoned this and took a while. And that's a big sad face. Don't do this. And now we use Lua. And Lua is really pretty. And this looks like JavaScript D and C E and it's nice. Uh, and we can do sort of procedural language straightforward. Everybody's used to writing it. It's all really easy to understand. And we have 
control blocks, and it's nice. So this is what we run now. We did suffer a 15 to 20% performance degradation switching to Lua JIT from Ratsoda Native. Uh, however, that trade-off is okay because it's so much easier to maintain. Everybody rejoice. Um, one of the things that's important here is how fast this system is, and it needs to be fast for a reason, and that is recovery and spikes in traffic. Um, we actually built in a 5x recovery speed to this uh, infrastructure, which means this is what the cores do on a rat's out of box when it's recovering. They go gangbusters. They go all out to try to consume uh, deserialized protobuf and do their joins as quickly as possible. We, we basically pin all the cores. Uh, and the reason for this is uh, we're only as good streaming as as fast as we can recover. Uh, if, if it's a system no one can rely on because we're just running really close to the edge of what's possible all the time, it'll never get adopted. And two, um, we have headroom. We have a tremendous amount of headroom. We could effectively quintuple our traffic and not buy any hardware and just let it run and it'll join forever. And it's great. Um, this, this graph is, uh, I, I turned off one of the rat soda nodes, number 44, uh, for 13 minutes, just to, because I needed a graph. Uh, and then I turned it back on, and it recovered in about two and a half minutes, right? So that it, it normally, normal processing load is around 150,000 rows a second to each individual rat soda node. It recovers at close to a million rows a second, and then reads through them all very quickly, and then catches back up to its normal processing speed. Uh, very cool. Okay, the next piece is SAMSA in our architecture. So those of you who don't know what SAMSA is, it is an Apache project. Uh, I think it's still incubating. It is a stream processing framework that also came out of LinkedIn, like Kafka. Um, it is, runs on top of Yarn as a multi-tenant. Uh, the, the design decision in SAMSA is that you get one Yarn container per partition of a topic that you want to process on Kafka. And there's the link if anyone wants to go check out more about it. Now, the good things about SAMSA. Now, we use SAMSA in our uh, particular stream to apply the business logic, right? So we let Ratsoda do the really heavy lifting here, the really hard work of all the joins and put all the just different pieces of information together at very high speed and produce a, a topic into Kafka that just has all the different pieces of information in one package, right? What we use SAMSA for is to pull this down, apply the business logic, which uh, already exists on the batch world, right? We already have it. So we can just take those jars and apply that business logic to the stream without having to sort of rewrite any code, which is actually really convenient. Um, but the good is it's fault tolerant, right? So it does checkpoint its progress, and it does this by pushing um, information back into a new topic in Kafka about its checkpoint information, which is good. That's a positive. Jobs are decoupled. So if I have uh, a SAMSA container operating on topic partition one, and I have one operating on topic partition two, they have nothing to do with each other. If one falls behind, two can continue to process totally fine, which means you can have a degradation. You can lose some number of things that fall behind, and you still have the vast majority of your data correct. Uh, it's durable in that it doesn't lose messages, which is good. Um, so part of that's through checkpointing. So that's the good. There's also some bad. Um, massive scale processing like we have requires massive scale, or at least bigger scale, Kafka clusters. So we have 32 node clusters, which are, I think, pretty big. Uh, we tried to run um, this particular join that Ratsoda does inside SAMSA, and the, the amount of load, apparently, the number of producers that you have into a Kafka cluster uh, directly impacts the amount of available CPU that's uh, available within that Kafka cluster to do other work. And as you push the producer count up very high, like SAMSA does because it has one producer consumer per container, right? it actually puts so much load on Kafka that things start to break down. And a lot of the, the things I covered about the bad in Kafka, uh, many slides up, were actually exposed because of that heavy load. Um, so it's not super efficient. It's written in, uh, the jobs are written in Java or Scala. And I'm not saying that Java and Scala are not fast but Java and Scala are not fast. I put this on the pro, I'm putting this on the con, it's fault, fault tolerant through checkpointing. All that really does by not using uh, 
by, by pushing your checkpoint topic back into Kafka is it puts even more load. We actually had a, a bug happen in production because someone turned their checkpoint timeout down really low to like 20 milliseconds. So they were writing this voluminous log and it actually filled up the disk on Kafka because they were checkpointing too often. And that's a good and a bad, that you could actually be exposed to some problems here. And finally, those of you who run on AWS are probably familiar with this, but YARN multi-tenancy means you don't control the box and you can have some other MapReduce job or something else happening inside YARN that takes cycles away from your process and causes you to lag and fall behind inside SAMSA. So there are things to keep in mind if you want, if you want to use it. So we finally arrived at the glorious Lambda future. We now have SAMSA, Ratsoda doing things in stream and we have batch, we have no query stitching. This is what it looks like. 70% 70, 70 of our transactions have a 10 second latency or less. 97% have a 30 second latency or less. That means you see an ad in 30 seconds, we have the transaction recorded at, at, in the worst case. We use six hours actually of join window instead of one hour partitions. Uh, we have no more late data problem. If something arrives three hours late, we just join it then and it shows up in the stream then because that's the end of the transaction. We do this on 10 bare metal machines. And we have built in 5X, 5X headroom, which means we can really do this on two machines, but that doesn't sound very responsible. So here's the comparison for you. Batch starts 10 minutes after the hour. It's at 30 minute runtime. The min latency of anything that we see in a batch system is 40 minutes in this company. Now, if you can imagine that you had an impression that served at the very beginning of an hour, like right at seven o'clock, right? In the seven o'clock hour, you had an impression that served. You're actually not going to see that until 8.40. So we have to wait for the hour to finish, the 10 minute delay, and then 30 minutes to process the data. So at 8.40, we'll know what happened at seven o'clock. On this side, we know in 10 to 30 seconds exactly what happened. We do 7,300 maps, 2,600 reducers, 24 yarn containers, 200 machines roughly to do this work. And on this side of the, the scale, we have 10 machines, 42 if you count the shared resource of the Kafka cluster, which I think is fair, because it is something you need to make this work. It's five times more efficient to stream process. Five times more efficient to stream process, at least in this way. So. We've covered it all. I'm not going to do five because we don't know how to do that yet. So I asked this question at the beginning. Most speed layer implementations choose RAM and best effort algorithms to uh, get approximations because it's really hard to do stream processing. And I'm, I'm saying that's not true. It can be just as accurate if you use the disk intelligently, use on-demand paging, and write some fast code to process all this stuff. And it's easy. And I'm here to report that I have failed so far to make it entirely accurate. We have gotten down to a 0.5% discrepancy between the batch system and the stream system. Now, that sounds pretty low. However, when you're dealing with 7 billion transactions, it's actually 35 million rows, which is a lot. So not entirely there. Some of this discrepancy is due to uh, by design. Like, We've decided to deduplicate data differently on the stream system than we do in the batch system on purpose because the batch system does something a little bit non-standard and the streaming system uses first in wins, which seems to be a fairly reasonable thing to do. So some of that discrepancy is just explained by the way we deduplicate differently. Some of it is explained by bugs and some of it is explained by data, lo data loss in Kafka. We're gonna close this gap. We're probably gonna close this gap soon. And then the argument will become, well, why do you have a batch system? Like if this is accurate and it recovers and it's really fast, why don't you just do this? And if you need to do some batch stuff, just take this data and write it into HDFS, already, already calculated and done. And you can do more analysis after the fact in HDFS if you have to. But why pay 200 machines worth of processing in 40 minutes and all that stuff if you can have it pretty fast? So that's my spiel. Thank you.